Hello, Manchester. I'm so happy to be here. <sighs> My name is Sophia Wallace. I'm an artist, and I'm here today to share with you a project that I hope will empower you personally, and by extension, those that you love, especially if they have a clitoris. <laughs> to make this work, I have to talk about independent female desire. I have to speak about a universal taboo, female genitals. This is not easy. It taints the speaker. I want to thank TEDx Salford for having me here and hosting this conversation. All bodies are entitled to experience the pleasure that they are capable of. This is a core pillar of clitoracy. In making this work, I had to say that the clitoris, first as an organ, has a right to being, and that this right is not just about not being cut off. Sadly, to this day, over 140 million women have had their external clitorises cut off. This doesn't make it into the news very often, and this doesn't come up in foreign policy discussion. So number one, the clitoris has a right to exist, free of harm, like any other organ. But secondly, I argue with clitoracy that the clitoris has a right to pleasure, and this is part of its primary right of being. How is it possible that we landed on the moon and walked around 29 years before we discovered the anatomy of the clitoris? We actually cloned sheep, identified the Higgs boson particle, and only discovered the clitoris 29 years ago. Unfortunately, this discovery has not been adopted, so most people don't know the actual anatomy of the clitoris. The clitoris is not a button. It is an iceberg. Like many of you in the room who are hearing this for the first time, I was shocked to find out that I didn't know the actual anatomy of half of the population, that I didn't know my own anatomy. In fact, the clitoris is not a button. It is like an iceberg. Most of the organ is internal. This slide is an anatomical example of the penis and the clitoris side by side. You know, we've all been taught that Male bodies and female bodies are opposites. The male body sort of sticks out. The female body is solely internal. Well, in fact, there are so many similarities between the penis and the clitoris. So if you'll see, both the glands and the glands of the penis and the glands of the clitoris, both organs have a glands. There are 3,000 nerves in the glands of the penis. There are 8,000 nerves in the glands of the clitoris. Both organs have a corpus cavernosum. Both organs have cura. Um, like two little legs or wings. Both organs have bulbs of erectile tissue. Both organs get erect. Um, the penis is outside of the body mostly, and the clitoris is inside the body mostly. That's the biggest difference. In fact, they're very similar. Actually, fetuses have the same tissue, and in boys it develops as a penis, in girls it develops as a clitoris. Um, some people have small penises, some people have very large clitorises. If one has a clitoris and takes testosterone, their clitoris can expand. What I'm saying is that these organs are actually quite similar. And while we are different, while we are unique as men and women, our, our, our differences are not a sign of opposition. In fact, um, we're related to each other, uh, we're connected, and, and that's an exciting fact. With clitoracy, I started with language. Language has been a place that so much of sort of the division of men and women and the subjugation of women has been entrenched with the language itself. Vagina, the single most misused word in the English language. This is one of the laws of clitoracy. It's intentionally hyperbolic, but unfortunately is more true than I wish it was. Vagina is a Latin word. It means sword holder. Vagina, medically, technically, only includes the opening. This term is used almost universally in doctor's offices. It's also used in, feminist, in feminism to sort of advocate, but it's a term that, reduces, that ignores the clitoris, which is the female sexual organ, 
Um, and secondly, it, it reduces the female body to being a receptacle, a sword holder. If you want to use a term that addresses all of female genitals, both the reproductive and the sexual parts of it, the word is vulva. This is a word that almost no one uses, but this is the word if you want to talk about female genitals, vulva. If you want to talk about pleasure, clitoris. Clitoris is the term. The clitoris is both internal and external. So um, when the clitoris is engaged, internal stimulation feels great. If the clitoris is not engaged, it can feel not great or it can feel painful. It's all about what's happening with the clitoris. If it was about the vagina, um, there would be so many nerves that childbirth would be impossible. There are very few nerves in the vagina. All of the nerves inside are from the internal clitoris, which gets stimulated both from the external and the internal portions. With clitoracy, I felt that, yes, language has been this way of restricting and confining the female body, but if language can do these things, it can also liberate, it can also be expansive. It's also an opportunity to come together. And so I sought to use language as a way to shift the discourse and create new space and more alignment. With clitoracy, I first began with a term and then a definition of the term and then an eye chart. And the aesthetics of this project were also extremely important and intentional. I avoided any kind of pink and purple. I didn't use flowers. I didn't use any fabric or yarn, anything soft and fluffy. I also didn't make any small works that you could hold in your hand um, or eat off of like plates. I also intentionally avoided any kind of uh, sexual imagery, any kind of uh, graphic, close-up, literal depictions. I think that everywhere we see the exposed female body, and yet we don't know the actual female sexual organ, the clitoris. So showing it is not the point, right? Understanding it is the point. Literacy of it, knowledge of it is the point. <laughs> the whole is not the whole. With clitoracy, I had a lot of fun with wordplay. There was just so much material to work with and so much to talk about. I also am making the radical claim with clitoracy that we can't truly be free if our bodies are assailed. We can't truly be um, fully enjoying our democracy when half of the population can't speak about their own body, is censored when they say the words because these words are taboo, or are regularly having sex without orgasms, and we don't talk about this. I'm making the radical claim that freedom in society can also be measured by the distribution of orgasms. This could be one indicator that we use and when we look at um, education, access to healthcare, uh, economics, we could also say, well, like, how are orgasms being distributed? Okay, that tells us something about a society. There is no lack, truly. Freud invented the paradigm of the phallus versus the lack. He said that Men have the phallus, they have the penis, they have agency. Women have a lack, they have a vagina, they have a void. Um, in fact, Freud was wrong. Uh, the vagina is not the female sexual organ, it is the clitoris. There is no lack, none of us have lack, none of us are lacking. We're all whole, and um, none of us need to be depicted in terms solely of, of a void. In many ways, all of us have had a psychological clitoridectomy because the clitoris is never taught. In sex education, it is taught that boys are both sexual and reproductive. Boys have erections. Boys have wet dreams. Boys ejaculate, and then the semen fertilizes the egg. Girls, we're taught, have reproductive organs. They menstruate. Menstruation is painful. Girls should not get pregnant if they don't mean to. Girls should not get sexually transmitted diseases. We never learn about the clitoris. We never learn that girls have desire, that this is natural, that girls have sexual dreams, that girls have fantasies. So already, as a culture, I would say we also all have clitoridectomies. Clitoris, say my name, say my name. I really enjoyed using wordplay and putting the clitoris into popular culture and song lyrics. Um, so much of popular culture, music, uh, the female genitals are kind of riffed on, but almost always in a negative way. 
Um, if you want to humiliate a man, call him a word for female genitals, right? But this is also an opportunity. You can just like pop in the clit. Suddenly the whole song changes. It's very powerful. So this is a Destiny's Child song. There's many more in the laws of clitoracy, like ain't no half step into the clit, <laughs> sleeping on the clit, that shit cray, which it is. Um, here's an example from looking below at the 100 laws of clitoracy. So this work spans um, 13 feet long by 10 feet tall. It dwarfs anyone's body. Uh, when I first showed this work, I had no idea what the response would be. Of course, I was hoping it would be positive, but I didn't know. And um, I have to say, I was overwhelmed with the way audiences responded. They really wanted to have this conversation. They would stay with the work for 15 minutes. I would come back, they would still be there. They would have friends with them. And I felt like this work was needed. Um, I was invited to speak about it a lot. And I was also contacted privately. Uh, people shared secrets with me. People told me for the first time they didn't feel ashamed about their body. Or they went home with this knowledge and are having a great time with their girlfriend and they wanted to thank me for that. So this was extremely gratifying. I think for me, what made me feel like I was onto something was that such a diverse group of people supported this project. Men and women, young and old, religious and secular, queer and straight, uh, so many people came together to support this project. And I was contacted by people from as far as New Zealand, Egypt, Brazil, saying, how can we help you with this project? Can you translate this project into Arabic or into Portuguese? Like, we need this here in our country. And I wanted Clitoracy to go everywhere, but uh, I didn't know how to do that yet, and I'm still figuring that out but I know that it's needed, and I know that it can't just stay within the walls of the art world. I don't consider myself a street artist, but I began making work on the street for the same reason that I think a lot of artists do. I wanted to communicate more broadly. This is an example of, uh, from a documentary of just me putting up some pieces. Uh, these are newsprint, they're prints that I made on newsprint, and then I'm putting them up with wheat paste, just like old posters were put up and I'm just doing this in Brooklyn. Uh, some people like to do street art at the nighttime. I do it in the day because I feel like it's a little safer, like the anonymity of the crowd in New York. So far, so good. And one of the cool things about doing street art is that people will comment on your work. Sometimes they cross it out or like destroy it, but other times they put their art on top of it. And in this case, that happened. Again, like when I showed the work in the gallery, uh, on the street, there was a big response. People would photograph it. They would post it on Twitter and Instagram. And it felt like I was talking about something that needed to be talked about, that the project was needed, and people were grateful to find it and keep pushing it out there more. Doing the street work emboldened me to take on even crazier ideas that I never thought I would find myself doing. Um, and I actually, together with um, an artist named Clit Eastwood, or Ken Thomas, held the world's first ever clit rodeo last summer. Uh, we created a rideable golden clit, <laughs> and we held the first clit rodeo. And, you know, there was two rules to the rodeo. Basically, one, respect the clit, respect it. Two, have fun. Those were the rules. And we had so many riders who wanted to ride, more than we could have a uh, host for our event. But the riders were judged on three categories, dexterity, style, and generosity. And they were really good riders, I have to say. I was worried that uh, it might get a little boring, because as you saw in the previous slide, there's just a spring. But people were reading erotica to the clit. Someone did like a strip tease for the clit. Uh, someone surfed the clit. Someone like offered a cigarette to the clit and then like, there was a couple where the woman was pregnant, like nine months pregnant, she was riding, and her husband was in the background as her backup dancer, like dancing around with like, <laughs> so it was way better than I ever expected, and uh, I just was thrilled because the clit was the star of the show, finally. I've always wanted clitoracy to be in the public space, to be at large scale, to be seen over time, not to have to be hidden away or be a secret, and I had the opportunity last fall, together with Center and Santa Fe, uh, we put up a 35-foot billboard of clitoracy, or 11-meter billboard, 
The text says, democracy without clitoracy, fallacy. And I was thrilled to do this, um, especially because where it was on this highway is traveled by such a broad range of people, from long haul truck drivers to art collectors, and then everyone in between. The billboard company was a little bit less psyched about how much feedback they got about the billboard, but I thought this was great. A lot of people were like, what are you selling? I don't understand. Um, I actually got a call that I'll never forget from a mom saying, I have to drive this route with my son every day, and I don't know what to tell him. But I was thrilled because she's going to talk to him about clitoracy, and this is something that he needs to know about. Clitoracy needs more than text, though, and I always knew that I wanted to explore the form as well. None of us know this form, right? I didn't know this form. Um, so I set about making the world's first anatomically correct sculpture of the clitoris. And this was something that was actually quite hard to do because there are so few accurate representations of the anatomy. And when you find these very few drawings um, or scans, they contradict each other, they don't make sense. Uh, so it was actually not that easy to do, but I set about making this form. And with the form, I wanted to not only explore the, the, the anatomy and, and get it accurate, but I also wanted to show the gesture of, of beauty of this organ and, and the gracefulness of it. Here is the first sculpture that I know of, of the anatomically correct clitoris. It's six feet tall and five feet wide. And I wanted to create an iconic form uh, of this unseen object, organ that all of us have, like half of us have. All of us were born through the body of someone that has a clitoris. Everyone in this room was born through the body of someone that has a clitoris. So all of us have been touched by the clitoris. This is universal, and yet we don't know about it. So I wanted to create an iconic form that's memorable, that puts this into our consciousness. And I hope that finally this form would be treated with honor and respect and not be treated as obscene. I think it's a beautiful form, and I didn't know it, but once I saw it, it started to feel familiar in this way. And I started to see it around in the natural world, in plants. I also saw it in engravings on architectural sites. I saw it in weavings of, of oriental tapestries. I started to see it around, and that was very exciting. And the form is interesting, not strictly as a sculpture, but in, the, in patterns. Um, there's something very exciting about looking into the power of the small, the power of multiplicity. Instead of creating just this singular, superior object, what about putting all these tiny, beautiful forms that together form a, a baby clit army? Uh, the one on the right, I call it fleur de clits. And the one on the left was later used in an uh, intervention at the Whitney Museum. So here's this sort of subversive clit army coming together to make the fleur de clit, which is this beautiful pattern. You know, but unfortunately, if some people knew what it was, it wouldn't be allowed to be. And that's sort of this, the rub of it. Here's an example of more uh, clit forms and patterns that I created. This is a clit damask pattern with clit forms burnished onto wood. Uh, on the left is a new sculpture. So this is the first sketch of an invisible clit sculpture. It's the same digital form that I used to make the gold sculpture I just showed you, but this exists in the negative space. So I used the laser to actually cut out the form from clear plexiglass. And so, this invisible sculpture addresses the fact that this is omnipresent, and yet it's negated, it's invisible, it's not allowed to be spoken of. I also continued with this idea of negation and using the laser to burn away with laser cut works on paper. And I developed a brand new technology. You might not have heard about it, but it's very cutting edge. I'll try to explain. It's called clit glass, and the way that it works, anyone can wear it. Anyone who wants neutral vision can wear a clit glass. So you put on the clit glass, and you look through the perspective of the clit, and the, the clit sort of refracts any kind of phallocentricity that's coming back at you. And so you obtain neutral vision, or what I like to call normal vision. <laughs> now you can use clit glass at the Whitney Museum, or you can use it at work, in front of the TV, even at a family reunion. 
This is an example of looking through this cutting edge technology. So those forms that I showed you earlier, I also played a game at my intervention at the Whitney Museum called Put a Clit on It, or <laughs> Clit Dazzle the Whitney. So basically, I handed out these forums, these unknown clit forums, and I said, you know, put the clit wherever you think it needs to go. Put it as a subject in art history. Put it into the designs. Put it on the American flag. The whole country has a problem with illiteracy. Help America out. Just take the clit where it needs to go. So you can see on the lower left, that's a Klitschenstein. And on the lower right, Klitsper Johns. This is the family at the Whitney Museum during the intervention. And the boy on the left, who looks to be about 11 years old, at one point asked his mom, you know, they'd been wearing the clit glasses for about 15 minutes, having a great time. He was like, Mom, what's a clit? <laughs> and she said, oh, it's a really sensitive part of the woman's body. And he was like, OK, cool. And I was thrilled because, one, he felt comfortable asking the question. Two, his mom was supportive and answered the question. And it was totally normal. Nothing obscene, nothing secret. No one had to be dragged out of the room. No one had to be ashamed. Um, and that's what I'm hoping that Clitoracy can continue to do. Overwhelmingly, the response to Clitoracy has been positive. So many people have supported the project and wanted to help with it. And there's been a few institutions who have courageously started showing it. But there's so much more that needs to be done. My dream is to radically change the way that we think about bodies so that everyone's body is respected. I want to do this by creating large-scale, permanent public sculptures that exist for thousands of years. I want to work with metals and stone so that these forms don't disappear in future generations and we don't have to have this conversation again and again. Democracy without clitoracy is a fallacy. I want clitoracy to be taught in school so that no child has an unnameable part of their body. The clit should be a starring role in any bedroom that it's in, and it shouldn't be censored in the parliament. So in closing, I want to ask you to see the clit. See it everywhere. Don't stop seeing it. And if you need help, you can borrow this pair of glasses from me. <laughs> and don't just stop with seeing it. Say it. Say its name. <laughs>